Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our second session uh, talk here in the session. Uh, and today, or now, right now, we really have the privilege uh, of having Pablo here, uh, who works at Bloomberg, uh, but he also is a very active C Python core developer, uh, and he's here to tell us about uh, improvements to error messages uh, in Python. So please join me in welcoming him. Hello, hello. Well, I've been told that I speak very fast, so buckle up because this is going to be a ride. <laughs> awesome. So, um, who I am? Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, so I will keep this brief. Um, so, I'm a C Python core developer. I'm serving on this year Python Steam Council member. I'm also the 310 and 311 release manager, and also I work at Bloomberg. But this is kind of boring, so let's talk about error messages, right? Cool. Um, so, let me, you know, all, all good talks start with a story, so let me tell you a story. So before joining, uh, I started doing computer science and engineering. I used to be a physicist, so I was doing my PhD. And although I'm a theoretical physicist, um, something that you need to do from time to time is that you need to do simulations. So at that time, doing those simulations is when I started using Python. And it was this day when some friend of mine that was also using Python, also doing their PhD in physics, uh, came to us. Uh, we were three in the room with one syntax error that they couldn't figure out. And we spent 15 minutes trying to figure out what was the problem. Think about that, right? Three physicists doing their PhD. We had the tools to solve the most deep mysteries of the universe, but we couldn't solve a syntax error. Quite bad. So, you know, syntax errors are important, right? Because like, they impact developer time and other things. Uh, so let me give you a tour over like, how the syntax error were before uh, Python 3.10 with like, a Fancy image there. Okay, so some of them. For example, this is the syntax error that I couldn't solve back in the day. What about that? What is wrong with that? <laughs> ah, interesting. So let me give you some context. Not the full program, but the, 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 the program looked like this, right? It was a bunch of things there. And does some, someone see the error? So the error is equivalent to this, right? Like you have a dictionary, you don't close the dictionary, and then you have a function definition. So the parser continues after the dictionary that should have ended, but is not end. And then it tries to, it finds the function and says, well, this function doesn't fit into a dictionary. And then it says, yeah, that is invalid syntax. But if you just see the thing, it's kind of not good, right? Like it's, it's, it's quite bad. So this is just one example, but there is more. Like for instance, what about this? What is wrong with that? Who knows what's wrong with that? The error is this one. It's kind of natural, right? Like you want to write a tuple there and then a generator comprehension, but it turns out that you need to parenthesize that tuple because otherwise the parser doesn't understand what you're writing. Not the best. Uh, what about this one? You have a list, uh, you don't close the list, and then you have a bunch of things, like for instance, you are assigning here something like that, and the parser says, yeah, that equal, I don't like that equal. It's invalid syntax. Or like, what about this? You have like a nice dictionary, so you, you, you map like core developers to their GitHub usernames. Uh, you forget a comma over there, and then the parser says, um, Guka Slanga is an invalid syntax, um, with, if you ask me, it's quite rude. Um, but you know, not good. Um, what about this? You try to do an exception, um, exception handler, but uh, with multiple exceptions, you forgot the uh, parentheses around, which you have to place there, and it tells you that that is invalid syntax, which is quite confusing, uh, especially if you're not used to this syntax with multiple exceptions, or if you are starting to learn Python. Uh, what about this? You are writing a dictionary and then you, I don't know, you freak out and don't put the, the value here or something like that, and then you close it and it tells you that, yeah, that bracket, no good. Um, so invalid syntax. Um, and this is the worst one of all. <laughs> like, like raise your hand if you have found this thing a single time. Yeah, yeah, I thought about that. So uh, this is like, especially like, uh, you know, like EOF, like, you know, how many times you have explained to someone what EOF means? Yeah, so, so the idea here is that, um, you know, in the previous version, we look at these things and then we say, look, the, the reason this were here is not because we are like lazy or something like that. It's because writing these things and integrating these things on the machinery of a big language like Python, it turns out that it's quite hard. Uh, but it turns out that now, uh, after Python 3.9, uh, we have a new parser, um, so I will talk about that in a, in a second. And this parser has allowed us to start thinking about, like, how can we solve these things? Like, can we improve the, the experience 
of people uh, writing Python that make error messages, like they, they, they make syntax errors, and they don't know what, they are, uh, what, what they mean when they get the error messages. And this is quite important because many people think that this is crucial for people learning the language, but it turns out that I'm, I have a plenty of experience using this, and I have been extremely happy that I have fixed many of these error messages since I did. So, so you know, it's also important for people that are experienced. So let's cover like, um, how, we fix the, uh, how we fix these errors using the new peg parsers. May, may, many of you may not know about these things, so let me introduce about uh, the peg parser. So the peg parser is something that uh, we did together with Lisandro San Angido on PEP 617. Uh, um, and basically what we did is replace the parsing in CPython, which originally was uh, introduced in, uh, in 1990, uh, in the one of the first comics of Python uh, from Guido. This is the old one, the old parser. And the new peg parser uh, was made 30 years after. So, you know, like the old parser was, it was a very resilient piece of uh, technology, but, you know, we thought that uh, we needed an, uh, a new parser because there was a bunch of things that we couldn't do with the old one, apart from maintenance-related uh, uh, topics and other things. So things that uh, we could have, uh, we can now do with the new parser are things like parenthesized context managers, which for technical reasons that I'm not going to go into detail, we couldn't do. These are much better because now you can put this kind of like, you know, open parenthesis and, and the subface over there. Uh, and also like, for instance, uh, match statements. Who likes match statements? Yeah, yeah I thought, yeah, yeah they are cool. Um, you can match a lot of things. So, so this is only possible with a new parser, which is great. But there is a problem. Many people see these things and they are quite angry because they think that the new peg parser is like the devil, right? Because now we have unlocked a world of darkness and, and horrible conclusions because now the peg parser allows to do super funky syntax and whatnot. But I want you to convince you that the new peg parser is actually quite helpful because, you know, yes, allows us to do things that you may not know, may like or not uh, may like, but that's, those were possible anyway, and we have a process to improve, improve Python syntax, and that's not the peg parser's fault, right? Like, you know, if you have a knife, the knife can serve multiple purposes. So I will leave you to your imagination what you can do with a knife. But like, the idea here is that the peg parser now finally allows to do these uh, new error messages, uh, which is quite cool. So let me, to convince you, in case you have not seen them before, um, let me show you some of the new error messages that we have in 3.10. We have quite a lot of them, so I'm not going to cover all of them. Um, but some, some, some of them. So for instance, new error message in Python 3.10. So imagine that you have this conditional, right? And then you uh, forget the colon over there, which is a common mistake, for, especially for people learning the language. So now we told you, yeah, expected colon. That's cool, right? Um, more things. So for instance, now similar things that we have before. You're writing a dictionary. Uh, you, for whatever reason, forget to write the value over there. And now when you do this thing, the parser tells you, oh, I actually expected uh, uh, you know, an expression after the dictionary key and the colon which is also quite cool. And uh, this is quite common, apparently. Uh, many, many people were super happy when we saw them this one. Uh, you are comparing something, and then you forgot uh, here that you should put a double equal. If you're writing C, uh, this seems to be quite bad, um, because you know, you're assigning to whatever you put on the left. In Python, it's a syntax error, but now we make you a suggestion. They say, oh, maybe you actually meant like, you know, um, two equals or, the, or um, instead of the, the single equals. Uh, more things, for instance, if you forget a comma in a, in a dictionary, here it's quite obvious, but like imagine you have those big configuration dictionaries instead of .py files or elsewhere, and you forget a comma, which is quite common. Uh, so instead of getting Gukas Langa's invalid syntax, uh, you get uh, you know, this, this error that tells you, oh, maybe, maybe you are forgetting a comma there. Uh, this has saved me at least 10 times already. Um, so, so, you know, oh, for example, this one as well, uh, if you are writing a conditional or many other blocks and then you don't indent them, corre indent them correctly, now we tell you like, oh, we actually spend it, uh, expected an indented block, and but then now we add that the indented block was after the if statement on line whatever. So you have the context, especially if you have like the block after the if is quite big, and when you mess the indentation is quite far from where do you write the if. Now we tell you exactly what construct uh, was wrong when you uh, unindented the thing. And of course, everyone's favorite, <laughs> when you don't close a dictionary and you have the function, uh, now we tell you, hey, that uh, bracket was not closed, uh, which is very cool. Uh, this is probably one of the, the ones that people like the most because this is quite common and the error is one of these, you know, unexpected in a file or your function definition is wrong. Um, cool, so this is a bunch of them, uh, uh, which is nice, but it turns out that um, adding error messages is quite hard. Um, let me uh, show you some of the uh, interesting stories that happened while we were developing error messages. So let's say, for instance, that you want to develop the following error message, like the, the, the missing comma, right? 
So for instance, you, you say like, I want this, right? If someone is writing a list and is missing a comma between two elements, so, so there is no comma there, you want to write this thing. So you are forgetting a comma. How do, will you do that? So you go to the grammar, and then you need to teach the parser how the problem looks like. So here we are, don't forget if you don't, don't understand this syntax, this is the back syntax, but here we were saying that if you see an expression followed by another expression, then you probably are missing a comma, right? Like things about a variable followed by a variable, or one plus one followed by three, or x, or something like that. Uh, in those cases, you know, that's invalid syntax, but that probably means that someone is missing a comma, right? And then you, you're happy, and then you say, okay, in that case, I'm going to raise this invalid syntax, perhaps you're missing a comma, and everything is good, right? No, 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 because like, what about this? Um, now someone forgets the in keyword and it tells you that perhaps you're missing a comma, which is wrong. Uh, what about this? Someone writes a valid uh, uh, string prefix and now it tells you that you are missing a comma, which is wrong. What about this? Uh, you, don't, you don't close the, uh, the tuple here and then you put a B after that and it's looking at the variable on the next line and the uh, two on the previous line and it tells you that you're missing a comma. Uh, what about this? This is quite bad, right? Like, look at this. Uh, it turns out that I don't know what is wrong with this, but like, apparently I'm missing a comma. Uh, <laughs> It's not good, right? Uh, what about this? Uh, you're writing a bunch of numbers. I mean, that, that's a bit crazy, but like, it's telling you, oh, this is quite weird. It's telling you that you're missing a comma, but not at the beginning, it's the last one. Um, okay. Um, so, and what about this? Like, apparently, match uh, starts to work. Uh, stops working because it's a soft keyword, and now when you do match foo, it's actually two names following together, that's symbolic syntax, and then it goes and tells you that you're missing a comma. So, we broke match statement. Sorry, Brent. Um, not good, right? Uh, it turns out that this is actually real. Uh, here you can see all the PRs that I fixed when I introduced the missing comma thing. Um, apparently, you know, knowing a lot of our parsers doesn't, uh, you know, make you not fail about missing commas. That's a quite hard thing to do. Um, what about, but what about this error? This is quite funny. So it turns out that um, our parser, is a, the PEC parser, uh, turns out that by nature they run in exponential time. This means that when they are parsing your input, uh, they take a time proportion exponential to the uh, number of characters that you input uh, into the parser. To avoid that, we have something called, well, we, we do something called a pack wrap parser, which is basically introducing memoization. So we use a cache in a fancy way. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go into details, but the interesting thing is that once you put the cache into the thing, the parser runs in linear time and it's very fast and everybody's happy. But uh, if you forget to put the cache, bad things can happen. For example, this thing in Python 3.10 takes two seconds to parse. It's a syntax error. So, you know, if you put a bunch of open brackets and then you put a colon, which is bad, uh, but it takes two seconds, the parser takes two seconds to realize that this is invalid. Uh, if you add a bunch of brackets, it takes over an hour. So uh, this is fixed, so don't worry about that. Uh, we, we fixed it here. Um, you know, someone was very happy that, that we fixed that one. Um, Probably they can, you know, now they need to spare one hour after to know that they commit a syntax error. But uh, the reason is because you need to be very careful when you uh, add error messages. Uh, the reason is because we have validated the real grammar of the language many, many, many times. We know it's fast. We know it works. Uh, we are quite sure about what's going on, uh, and that is great. But it turns out that adding error messages is a whole new world. The reason is because the grammar, like parsers like to know about what is correct about your language. That's what they are made for, right? But now you are starting to use a parser into a word which is infinitely big, right? It's the word of things that are not Python. And that is much, much more tricky, especially if you start using some of these invalid rules from invalid rules and combining them with the real language. And the problem is that validating that those things are correct and they don't raise weird syntax errors in weird constructs like the comma that you saw before, or for instance, uh, these fancy brackets, um, is quite hard. And it requires, what we found, is that it requires much more effort and much more validation. Since then, we have made a lot of improvements to the parser and to the techniques we use to validate these things. But as you can see, sometimes they slip over and you know, people make fun of us in Twitter. So please don't make fun of us in Twitter. We work very hard. Um, um, if you want, you can use this thing as a, time, uh, as a timer. So you know, if you made your, your lunch and it, it takes an hour, so you can put this thing running and then come back when, when it finishes, um, which is cool. Okay. So these are the syntax errors, which is great. We solve a bunch of them, and, and you can see all of the ones that we added in Python 3.10 on the What's New document of Python 3.10. Uh, but you can also see uh, the ones that we have added in 3.11, and we will add more in the future. But we have even more things. For instance, we have runtime suggestions. So what are these things? These are not syntax errors. These are errors that happen at runtime. 
For example, this one. Uh, if now in Python 3.10, if you do, uh, so in collections is the module collection, so if you, uh, you type incorrectly some attribute of the module, now we have, uh, we offer suggestions. So for instance, if you say name tuple, which is um, not good, so now we tell you like, okay, you, maybe you mean name tuple. And this works with everything. This works with modules, with custom classes, with things in the standard library, third party module, everything. And this is great. Uh, we not only offer this thing on attribute access, we also offer this thing on name access. So for instance, here I'm assigning uh, one variable to Svarsil black hole. Um, I pronounced it that correctly, I hope so. Uh, and then uh, you mis mistype this thing because it's very easy to mistype uh, and then you get a correct suggestion. Uh, believe me, that is the correct version, uh, So, which is very cool. Um, you know, it's a small improvement, but it turns out that uh, it saves a lot of time, especially when you mistype a variable in a big, big function, um, because it immediately will tell you what's going on. And I have, th I, this is my, one of my favorites, because since we added this one, uh, it, this has helped myself, uh, even when we were developing this one, so it's, it's quite cool. Um, but the question is like, okay, so how, how this, this, these errors are done? Because it's, it's a very interesting um, like category of errors, right? So let me, let me explain to you how we did this one. It's very interesting. So the first thing, is that now we have extended uh, some exceptions, in particular attribute error exceptions, with two things. Now these exceptions in 3.10 know the name of the attribute that you were trying to access and the object in which uh, you were trying to access. So if this was the collection module, the object will be the collection module and the name will be named tuple, uh, badly written. In this example it will be x and something. Um, and then, uh, which is written there, I don't know why I don't read my own slides. <laughs> but then this is an attribute error, it bubbles up, and then we run a, a word distance function. This is a very simplified version that fits into slide. The one that we use is, I don't know, 200 lines of C code, not re great, really great for presentations. But the idea is that this is a very simple algorithm. It uses like some version of uh, Levenstein distance to know which uh, uh, are the um, closest strings to the one that we provide, and then it will tell you, okay, so maybe, you know, these are the ones that we think is the best match. It looks at the deed of the object to distinguish which ones are the great. So basically the algorithm is that once you have this word instance function, uh, you do something like, okay, so I will, I'm going to use the deed function to know in the exception all the possible attributes that are uh, in the object. And then I'm going to one by one check the word instance to that one. I'm going to pick the smaller one and that's probably the suggestion. Uh, we have a ton of extra checks every here and there um, to make sure that we don't do weird things with those, but this is basically the algorithm. But wait, there is something. Think about this, right? Uh, attribute errors are raised all over the place. If we start doing this algorithm to check where are the probable ex like exceptions that are closer and the names, this is very, very expensive. So we don't do this thing on attribute errors because it will make Python much lower, right? So what we do here, and I'm basically what I'm saying is that this thing needs to be fast because if you catch the attribute, the attribute error, nobody will see those, uh, those uh, suggestions and we need to make sure that this, this kind of code is still is fast, right? So what we do here, this is, um, you know, this is C code of freak out, but um, I will explain. So what we do here in this C code is basically that instead of doing this thing when you raise the exception, we do this thing on this fancy function that is called print exception. So we only do this thing when the exception has bubbled up to the top level and the interpreter is going to crash already because nobody has caught the exception. So when we are printing the traceback and you know all those messages because uh, the interpreter is going to finish, then at that st as the step, the last thing that we do is this print exception suggestions, which runs the function that I just showed to you. And then then it goes and it offers you the suggestions that we just, you just saw. Um, so basically, well, that, that function over there. Um, which is very cool, and so that's, that way we keep Python fast. Uh, we only do this thing on, on when the interpreter is going to finalize, and a code that runs normally and catches exception uh, keeps being fast. This is just an example to show you that error messages are quite hard because now you need to, t like, you can try to be nice to people, but you need to make sure that, like, normal usage of the language still is fast and people don't pay the cost of good error messages in normal code that doesn't raise error messages. So more things that we have added. I'm very excited about this one. So this is better traceback on Python 3.11. So let me show you what this is about. So this is PEP657 uh, with a, that I did with Amara Skara and Batu Hantaskaya. Uh, it has this horrible name, include fine grain errors location in traceback, but I assure you that the thing is actually much more uh, great than the name that we placed there. And it looks like this, basically. So uh, if you before have like, um, you know, a bunch of errors, uh, uh, this is a traceback for some code. And here it's, it's telling you that in this long expression, so absolute value of this, 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 the error is non-type object has no attribute X. It means that something in this long line is non. But which one it is, you don't know. You probably need to attach a debugger and know what's going on there, which is not cool. 
Uh, but now in Python 3.11, we, we show you exactly which one of this is known, which was this one. Uh, which is much more uh, better, uh, we believe. And we also show you like in the, uh, the, this fancy underlying carrots in all the traceback. Uh, this is also very useful when you do dictionary access. So before, for instance, you are accessing a big JSON, some response and a bunch of things here. And the error is non-type object is not subscriptable, which means that in this response, some of these levels is known, but you don't know which one it is. But now in 3.11, we tell you which one is the one that is known, which is great. Uh, much better and you know you, you can see also like in the traceback which part of the function calls were running because for instance in this particular line here you could, could be this one over here with user one or this one here with user two now you know which one it is so now you don't need to touch a debugger which we think is fantastic also if you are doing like some heavy math um, super complicated this division thing uh, is quite quite hardcore uh, but now it tells you division by zero uh, which of those divisions are zero now in 311 uh, will tell you which one and uh, that one um, so that's great so how we do this thing so we do this thing basically by injecting into every bytecode instruction extra information like for instance if you disassemble that dictionary access you will see that it's made of python instructions which is what we call bytecode and what we do is that for to every of those instructions we attach extra information you can actually check this extra information using the this module and it will tell you that for every for instance in this binary subscript one of these ac dictionary access now it has the line number when that happens the end line number the column offset, uh, then column offset. And we use this information uh, to know uh, and to show you where that happens. The actual code to print this thing is quite hardcore. It doesn't look great, um, but it's just that, you know, it's quite complicated, but it's very nice because we take into account many things like, uh, for instance, if you have a binary operator, we point you to the exact uh, binary, like the plus or the minus or whatever, and we underline different in both sides. So this is just to show you that we put a lot of effort to make sure that, that those errors look nice, they are not intrusive, and we can uh, highlight as much information as is possible. Uh, so basically how we do this thing. So imagine that you have this code. So once we know that is an error with this code, uh, we, analyze, um, the, we, we analyze the bytecode instructions from the bytecode instructions of that code with the line numbers and the column offsets that we have already there. Then we basically reparse that expression because we know that it has to be valid because it's valid Python code. We, we get the abstract syntax tree of that expression and then we combine these two to offer a customized error messages. In this case, for instance, we use the abstract syntax tree to know that this is a binary operator and then we use the, um, the error positions to know that we need to point here and then we use that information to also add this little caret over here apart from the underscores um, which you know is not easy but but it looks very great um, nice so so this is all great um, but now you may be thinking um, you know how how can I help this because you know I like error messages uh, I would like to help uh, developing new error messages and making Python great and we would love you uh, to help us uh, so I'm going to teach you how you can help us uh, do error messages well, the first thing that you can do is to open issues. Now, Python, the issue tracker runs on GitHub, uh, which is quite nice. Finally, we managed to do that. Uh, more in the keynote tomorrow with the Steam Council. Uh, but uh, now you can open an issue and they have a tracker for CPython telling us uh, suggestions that you think we should care. We will tell you sometimes that that suggestion is actually very difficult or it will mess with other things. So, you know, have an open mind. Don't get frustrated if we tell you that it's very difficult or impossible to add your, your error messages. But many times this has been happening already. People have come to our issue tracker and have suggested, oh, what about this particular error? And we have implemented that. So if you have ideas, especially if you are starting to learn Python, for instance, and you have been frustrated with some of these error messages, it will be super useful if you come to us and tell us, okay, this has been super hard, you know, I struggled 20 minutes, uh, I'm doing a PhD and I was not able to do this. Um, so that's a good candidate, right? Also, if you're an educator, you're teaching Python, and then you see a lot of your students struggling with error messages, we would love to know which ones are the ones that, you know, people struggle with the most. If you're a bit more hardcore, I want you to call them themse uh, yourself uh, the best place to start is to go to this guide that I wrote in the uh, Python dev guide. So if you Google Python dev guide parser, here is this big document called guide to see Python parser. Uh, it's very technical, but um, I think it reads quite nice. Um, some other core developers can uh, validate this, uh, this assertion. But the idea is that here you can understand how the parser works uh, in very good detail. And at the end of this, this, this guide, there is a section about uh, how to add new error messages and how to validate your error messages. So you can read that, and then you can try to add some error messages. You add a bunch of test cases, and you can submit a PR to C Python, which will be very cool. 
not only that, but a lot of people have already been doing that. This is a bunch of error messages that have been uh, uh, proposed by members of the community, not by myself, and they have improved, and some of them, uh, well, except this one, which is an issue that is still open, but all of them will ship in 3.11, which is super great. So you can be one of these people, um, maybe with cooler avatars, um, but uh, you can pr uh, propose new error messages, and I would love to review your PRs. It's just that you know you need to get, take into account that can we this thing with an open mind? Because as you saw, error messages are quite hard, and sometimes people are very excited and they bring their little error message that looks super great on some particular cases. But it turns out that you know we need to turn it down because it's quite complex. So you know have, a, have an open mind when you propose uh, these error messages. Uh, and that's basically that's basically it. I hope that um, you have learned a bit uh, about this thing. I think the moral of the story is that uh, if you are doing your PSD and then you lose your battle against some syntax errors, then you can study during, during years about parsers and grammars. You can make a new version of the parser of one of the most popular languages in the world. You can join the core dev team and then you can improve the situation. Or you can alternative wait until someone else does this and then you can use it. Uh, thank you very much and I hope you have enjoyed it.